Well, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll we'll dive back in here. I know it's been what three weeks, three weeks. Four weeks. Well, for you, four. <laughs> Father, we're grateful for another opportunity to gather to study your word tonight. I thank you for these who have come out, Lord, with a with a heart turned toward you and a mind set on discovering the things that you have for them. Open our hearts and minds tonight to receive the things that you have here for us. Open your word that we might peer deeply into it and discover the riches that you've placed there. And we'll thank you and praise and honor you as you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, so here we go. So we are in Romans chapter 8. And um, for those of you who have been in the study um, all along, uh, you know I've been pointing to this chapter um, pretty much from the beginning of the study, talking about the content of chapter 8 and how, um, to me, chapter 8 is really the, the, the culmination of everything that, that Paul led up to at this point. And, and it's really, there, there's a, a key to the Christian life that Paul reveals and explains in chapter 8 that I'm really hoping will be, will be beneficial to uh, you all. So, as an intro to the chapter, chapter 6, in chapter 6, I should say, Paul explained why a Christian wants, to, wants not to sin, even though Christ has taken all of the penalties. However, Paul's advice on how a Christian can avoid sinning um, was, quote, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God, chapter 6, verse 11. And do not let sin reign in your mortal body, verse 12. And do not offer the parts of your body to sin, but rather to God, verse 13. And all of this counting, not letting, and not offering might sound as though life under grace is as much <coughs> like life under the law and and that we acquire the holy character of God that God desires by sheer effort of our wills. And if you just take those that that section, that's what it sounds like. Okay, pull yourself by, up by your bootstraps, suck it up, cupcake, get it done. But that's not what Paul's talking about. Um, then Paul explained how we died to the law as well as the sin in chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Because we were sinful, the law brought us death, not life. And you can see that in uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 7 through 13. Therefore, we had to die to the law through Christ, having died to the law's penalty of death. We now find we fervently desire to keep God's law, but we are unable to do so because our sin nature persists in us. And you can see that in 14 to 25. How then can we become holy and righteous in our character? Chapter 7 makes it clear that we cannot, by our willpower, obey chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, or keep the law we delight in. And then the... the um, direction here is as you prepared for this study tonight to read chapter 7 verses 4 through 6 and then chapter 8 verses 1 through 17. Any question on any of that before we move on here? Any clarification needed? We, buddy, where we need? Honey, can I get you to get me a bottle of water please? Sure. So this chapter starts with a famous phrase, no condemnation. Uh, Mike, can I, well, let me see. Ron, you've got it up already over there. Can you read chapter, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 for me, please? Thank you. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's not Romans 8. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. No, it's a different five lap. That was Acts 8. I'm ready. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, one to four? Yes, please. There is therefore now, there is therefore now 
no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay, thank you. In light of our recent discussions, and all that Paul has shown us thus far in Romans, to what condemnation is he referring in verse 1? In light of our recent discussions, and all that Paul has shown us thus far in Romans, to what condemnation is he referring in verse 1? By what are we no longer condemned? Mike? We're going to have a sin in our lives. Uh, we're, we're not, we're, it's our sinful nature. We're not, we're not, not condemned. God won't condemn us for it. Okay. We'll have to pay the price for our sins. Okay. Okay. Somebody else? We're not guilty anymore. We're guilty of what? Of sin. Guilty according to what measure? According to Christ's death on the cross. Well, would, were, are we guilty because of Christ's death on the cross? We're not guilty. Okay, why are we guilty? Or should we be guilty? You said should we be? Yeah. Well, since Christ died for us. Well, you, without Christ, why are we guilty? It's our sin nature because no matter what we try to do, as good as we might want to be and how much we want to follow Christ, we just can't do it on our own because we want to follow fleshly desires. Okay. And it always seems to be that war between the two. Like, we just can't do it. What is the standard of measure that God used to define or to help us to understand what sin is? The law. The law. The law. Yay. That's the phrase I was looking for. The law. Yeah. We are all, we're all guilty under the law. If, if, if all of us were to stand just on the basis of the law, there's nobody righteous, not one. And we're all condemned by that. And condemnation under the law as guilty of violation of the law is what we're talking about, but not only sentenced to death, but put to death. Because that's what we deserve. That's what condemnation is. It's not just the pronouncing of the sentence, but the execution of the sentence. Okay, so we're not condemned under the law uh, any longer. Is this understanding the this understanding of this of his point? Man, I can't read tonight. This is the understanding of his point based on the context, but it does not negate the encouragement of our being free from condemnation in a broader sense. Does that make sense to anybody? Do you understand what I'm trying to say there? I didn't hear it. Is no. this thing on? I was right, so I didn't hear it. That's okay. <laughs> Con um, this is the understanding of his point based on context, but does it negate the encouragement of our being free from condemnation in a broader sense? Is there a broader sense in which we're free from condemnation? Am I not making any sense tonight? Everybody's still trying to get up to speed. What, Kathy? I'm not sure if it's you or me. Surely. No, that's that's. When when 
when we use this phrase, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, it, it's not, yes, Paul in the context, Ron, what, were you going to say something? Saying that there, there's still stuff we have to do, it's just not a blanket, it's all done. Is that what you're trying to say? No, no. What I'm saying is, for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk off after the Spirit, not after the flesh, there is no condemnation. Not just freedom from the condemnation of the law. If Jesus has freed us from being condemned by God's law, we must certainly not be condemned by Him for any lesser failure as we live in this new relationship with Him. How many people have, have you known, or maybe you have, felt guilty and condemned because you didn't meet up to some criteria. Okay? Yeah. Now we're getting to the nub of it. You know? You didn't meet this level of expectation by those you deemed more spiritual, so you feel condemned. Okay? Or you, you think you're condemned. In fact, sometimes some supposedly spiritual people will heap condemnation on other people to make themselves look better. They would never put it that way. You know, I, is, that, is that making any sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was talking about that being condemned, and it was like you're not condemned of sin, but you're condemned unto righteousness. And I asked them to explain that to me. And it was like, because you, you're not, the Bible tells us we're not condemned. You know, it says that because when you do sin, it's like because of who you are in Christ, the righteousness is compared to, does this not, with the sin that you committed, because of who you are in Christ, does it not, but what you did, it does not line up to, who you're supposed to be in Christ. Okay. So no, you're not going to beat yourself up for sinning, but yet you should make sure that whatever you did lines up with the righteousness of God. Okay, and I would agree with that. And I would agree with what you said with one exception. I, I would not accept being condemned for that, convicted for that. That's yes. exactly what they said to me. Yes. You're not condemned. Condemned, but exactly. the conviction of the righteousness should make you feel bad about what you did. And bring you to repentance. Exactly. Right. Okay, it's, so it, yeah, it's the conviction. Exactly, that was the word. I conviction. About yeah, conviction, not right. condemnation. Okay. Because there is no, we, we are not condemned right. by God. He does not condemn us. But he convicts us. Correct. Now, uh, and I, I want to be careful here not to say that we can never be condemned by God. Right. We're not, I'm not going there. We'll get there at a later point in chapter 8. We'll talk about that sort of where we may, there is a line we could cross where we would once again enter into God's judgment. But you've also heard me say, I don't know where that line is. I don't want to know where it is. It's way over there somewhere. <laughs> for, for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, there is no condemnation. Now, if our minds or emotions, if in our minds or in our emotions we are thinking or feeling condemned, we can rest assured it's not God. Now I'm seeing heads shaking. Now you're getting where I'm coming from. Do we feel condemned sometimes? We feel worthless and beat down like a miserable failure? Yeah. Two sources of that, our own flesh and the enemy of our soul who loves to beat you down when you start feeling bad. And when you think, when your mind says, well, I failed to this degree, what's the answer to sin? Repent. Repentance. And... For those who are in Christ, we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been cleansed. We've been justified, made just as if we never sinned. 
And if we sin, what does Scripture tell us to do? If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, I, I have one that I'm going to share with you guys. <coughs> because um, we were recently out looking for new furniture. And one of the places we were looking at that are zero financing for one year, blah, 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 blah. So I started talking to the guys who were filling out the application and started rattling like numbers from my credit score, like very prideful, you know? When I got home later on, I was thinking about that exchange, like in my mind, it just popped up again. And I thought, you know, that's a perfect demonstration of me and my pride. Because I, I am a prideful person. Okay. It's like one of the sins I have to deal with. Uh -huh. right? And I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I'm not being condemned for this, but the Holy Spirit is convicting yes, me and pointing it out exactly. to me. And so right there, I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to do better with mm -hmm. this. Do you know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. that's like one clear example. Yeah. Because like I wasn't beating myself up over it, but it was but, like an aha moment. Yeah. The light came on yeah. it. It was like, oh, yeah, that's not the way I'm supposed to be behaving. And right. By the grace of God, I'm yeah. in the position I'm in. And that's, that's a great illustration of the distinction between condemnation and conviction. Um, Condemnate it when when the enemy of your soul is condemning you, there is no relief. It spirals down. There is no relief. You know, no matter what you do, you confess, you 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 cry out to God. There is no relief because he's got his crooked finger pointed in your face and he's continuing continuing to heap it on. The Bible says if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when the Spirit of God convicts us, because He does that, why does He convict us? To condemn us? No. To grow. Why does He convict us, Elaine? He convicts us to show us our errors. And it doesn't line up with who you're supposed to be in Him. And what's the ultimate goal of that, Jamie? To grow. To grow what? To grow more like Christ. Yeah, to, yeah exactly. To be conformed to the image of His Son. Yeah. You know, he loves us enough to show us what's wrong. But he won't beat you for it. If you're getting beat for it, it's not him. Because that's there's no condemnation. First Peter says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, um, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all of your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Now, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And that's exactly what I've been talking about. But resist him firm in your faith, Jamie, like you were saying, knowing that the same experience of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. There is no temptation but such as is common to man. If you're dealing with some kind of an issue, you're not alone. Somebody else has been dealing with it too. And somebody else has gotten victory over it by the grace of God. And they can help you to find that victory. You know? And that's why we, we need one another to walk through this. I can't believe I'm going to do this. But I, there's an illustration in, in the, the show The West Wing that we've watched. And the, the, the story is this guy's... He, he falls into a hole, and when he's down in a hole, he says that the the, uh, uh, the priest comes by, and he says, "Father, can you help me out? I'm down in this hole." And the priest writes out a prayer and throws it down in a hole. What was the other one? He, doctor. Oh, a doctor came by. A doctor walks by, sees a guy down in a hole. He says, "Hey, doc, can you help me out? I'm down in this hole." Doctor writes out a prescription, throws it down in a hole. The friend comes along and says, "He says, hey." Hey, Ron, can you help me out? I'm down in this hole. And Ron jumps down in the hole with you. He says, well, that was stupid. Now you're down in the hole with me. But the friend says, but I know the way out. I love that illustration. Because that's what we do as Christians. When a brother, That's why we need to confess our faults, confess our weaknesses one to another, that we might be healed. And if... And if, if If someone heaps condemnation on you, apply the Gomer Pyle rule. 
Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Just don't go to that person again. Recognize that in Christ, you're free from condemnation. You don't need to take a beating. Nobody has a right to run you down and to, to, to beat you down. You know, somebody that does that doesn't get grace. They don't understand what Jesus has done for them and the price that he paid for them. And that's arrogance and religious pride, and there's no place for that in the kingdom. That's a pretty bold statement. I can't believe I just said it. But it's true. You know, the, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We're all human beings. We're all going to fail. That doesn't mean we justify one another's sin and we say, oh, it's okay, Deneen. You can go and rob that grocery store again tomorrow. Not that Doreen, 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 uh, Deneen has ever robbed anything that I know of. <laughs> But you understand the point that I'm saying, what I'm getting at. Or, it's okay, Jamie, you can be arrogant and boastful. It's all right, God understands. Yes, he understands, but he understands enough to show you, Jamie, come on, baby girl, you, you, you missed the boat there, you know. And he helps us to do better. That's, we should be like him in these matters, okay? Jamie. Well, there really are, but go ahead. But I, I mean, but no, you had said that there are no degrees. You know, just because you sin differently than I do doesn't give me the right to judge you or your sin. Okay, yeah. You know what I'm okay. saying? So that, that helped me a lot for what the course of this, you know, not to be so judgmental. Yeah, there, there are, I mean, there are degrees of sin because there, uh, I think it's Paul that says there is a sin unto death. You know, and Jesus says that there is there is a sin that is unpardonable. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So yeah. there are degrees, but from the perspective that you're saying, we have, that doesn't give us any right to look down our nose at anyone else. Is it fair to say, as the Scripture says, all sin is unrighteous? Absolutely. So all, it, it, sin is a sin. Yeah. But yeah. as you stated, there's degrees. Yeah. So and consequences can be exactly. the consequences. Consequences can be different, yeah. And if you if you really want weight, you, you really want to feel like something that's a bit too much to carry. How about this one? To him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Right. Well, that that could give you a cat of nine tails to self-flagellate yourself with through the course of the day. <laughs> yeah. You know, because we all we all do stuff that we know we shouldn't do, and then we go, "Oh, stupid." I think that was. Might have been. But God's grace is sufficient and his mercies are new every morning. And he helps us and he convicts us and draws us. Kathy, you had something you were getting ready to say. Oh, no, I was just saying that, um, you know, like, you know, each deep sin can condemn, I mean, can send you to hell. You know, it does not matter. And there are, like, certain things that I think that penalty, <clears throat> like, sometimes there's a natural penalty. You know, if I steal a car, it, then I need to go to jail. <laughs> you know, so, right. whereas if I yell at my mom or my dad, that's still, you know. You might get backhanded for that one. Yeah. But I probably you lie to your spend, boss, you could get fired. I probably won't spend any time in jail. Right. <laughs> right. You just not. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it, we can't look at because, you know, I can be so self right and say, well, I've never done that. Yeah. Well, point to the 500 things I have done. Right. right. You know, right. It doesn't matter. And the, and the bottom line of that is, sin is sin. The violation of God's will like is sin. That What's that? We like to sometimes pick up certain things because it makes us feel more holy. Or something. Makes us feel superior. Yeah, yeah. Or somebody else feel dirtier. You know, the, the, we, uh, the church has a long history of holding up those sinners that had horrific lifestyles sex drugs rock and roll whatever it is you fill in the blank 
and we hold them up. Oh, look what God did to set this person free. But what about that person that was raised in the church that came to the altar one day because they recognized they needed Jesus? That person was every bit as destined for hell as the person that whose lifestyle was physically, emotionally, and otherwise destructive. You understand what I'm saying? And that's the degrees that that's yeah. So one more scripture for you here, if I can get on the right page. Second Corinthians chapter two eleven says, and this is in the context of extending forgiveness that Paul declares so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan for we are not ignorant of his schemes you know I don't go run, running around looking for the devil and neither should you you know I, when I was first saved and most of you have heard me make this statement when I was first saved I was looking for the Antichrist because I wanted to make sure I knew who he was so I didn't fall on and the Lord convict, convicted me of that and told me, don't look for the Antichrist, look for the Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, but don't be ignorant of the fact that we do have an adversary, and he's out there, and he's looking to destroy us, you know, so. Okay, moving on. Question two. How does Paul describe the Christian life in chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, and chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Ron, can you get chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, Jamie 7, 14 to 25, and uh, 14 to 21, I should say. Elaine Berger, 21 to, chapter 7, verses 21 to 25, and then Deneen, chapter 8. Do you have a Bible? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Jesus Christ, so that you may be joined to another, <clears throat> to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear the uh, fruit for death. But now that we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound to, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay, seven, uh, 14 through 25, please. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what am I doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law. Wait, wait, wait. Elaine's going to do 21 to 25. Thank you. Me? Yeah. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the, from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay, and then 8, 1, and 2, please. There is therefore no, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
and may we flee from the law of sin and death. Okay, thank you. So, how does Paul describe the Christian life in in chapter four, uh, chapter seven, verses four through six? Norma? He's telling us that we need to bear fruit to God and to die to self and to serve in the newness of the Spirit. Okay. 7 verses 4 through 6. You're right, but yeah. Um, God supplies the power to live the Christian life through the Holy Spirit. And we no longer are trying to reach God by keeping rules, but by serving Him out of love and gratitude, and we live in the Spirit. Okay, all of that is true. <coughs> serving in the newness, we're serving in the newness of the Spirit. Serving in the newness of the Spirit, okay. Okay, he says there that we are dead to the law, and alive to the Spirit in Christ, the Spirit being referring to the Holy Spirit. What does it mean by we're dead to the law? This is kind of review a little bit. What, what did he mean by we were dead to the law? Correct. As, as regards being righteous before God. It doesn't mean, does that mean we can reject the moral law? We don't have to worry about the moral law. No, and I know that's not what you're saying. Yeah, but it, we don't rely on the law. The, we're dead to the law as far as obedience goes. We're not looking to follow the law to be right with God. It's the Spirit of God working in us because of what Jesus has done that brings about that, that righteousness that we're longing for. What about in verses uh, 14 to 25? Wait a minute. Yeah, 14 to 25. How does Paul describe the Christian life there? That even though we're with God, that the sinful nature still remains in us. Okay. Because when he tries to do right, and wants to do right, evil is all around him, and he gives in to it. Okay. So that sinful nature is still within us. So we do our own thing, even though we don't want to do it. Okay. Somebody else? Something to add, Jamie? I'm basically the same thing, that even though we try to be good and we know what is good, we can't do it because of our sin nature. Okay. Yeah, and, but we're free from bondage to sin. Right. Before Christ, before we yield to Christ, we're bound by sin. We have no choice but to sin because there's no freedom from it. Even if we look to do good, there's going to be pride or human, you know, it's going to be unrighteous motivation behind that. It's to look impressive or to, well, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy because I, well, what's that? That's pride, arrogance, and the evil way, you know? So apart from Christ, we're bound in sin. We, we can't be free from it. But having been freed from that bondage to sin, that tension is still there. That old nature is still pulling, and, and you know, that it's that, that tug of war, if you will, uh, to a degree, where the old nature is still alive, and we need to recognize that and stand against it by the power of the Spirit. What about, um, what does Paul, how does Paul describe the Christian life in 8, 1, and 2? Jamie. Because of what? We're secure. Okay. Okay. We're free from the condemnation of the Old Testament law. And we're free from condemnation for our sin. As we submit to the rule and the law of the Holy Spirit who gives us new life in Christ. So...
does that give us yeah uh, and I made this point up above I didn't hit it but as we've discussed this is not a license to live lawlessly according to the flesh you know I oh I've been redeemed by the blood of the land bless God pass another beer would you And I'm just picking on that one thing. You know, I'm going to go to the strip club because, you know, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb so I can go to the strip club. No, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I can lost, cheat, and steal but because I'm washed in the blood. No, that doesn't give us a license to do that. Um, but it's a comfort when we merely fail because of the influence of our flesh. Understand what I, the distinction I'm making? It doesn't give us the right or the freedom to go and just pursue what we want to do. Our ticket's punched, I'm going to heaven. I don't understand when you say that it's a comfort or when we merely fail. What does that mean? The, 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 the freedom that we have in Christ the freedom from condemnation. Oh, okay. We have that comfort okay. that we have been freed from con when I fail. Okay. Like Jamie said, when she failed, you know, she doesn't need to take a beating for that. Right. Okay. What what do we do with it? We take it to him. We cover it with the blood. You know, that that used to be uh, popular in the in the church back in the day. Are are are, are you covered in the blood? Covered in the blood. <laughs> Plead the blood, you know. I never really understood that, but but I get the concept, you know. Christ's blood is paid for, but that's not an excuse to go out and live any way we want. You know, and again, we'll, more of this as we go forward. Okay. What is Paul referring to in his description of the law in the first part of verse 3? as being weak through the flesh. Jamie? Our ability, our inability to not sin. Okay. Okay. Somebody else? It's true. A little bit more. Elaine? The law could not remove sin. Okay. The law could not remove sin from us. No. Okay, that's good. Our inability to obey the law, the law could not remove sin. And we don't have to it doesn't, it really isn't covered. Did the law cover it? Um, no, not the law, the, the, um, the sacrifice. Okay. You know, that, it just, it covered it. It, mm -hmm. didn't, it didn't get rid of it. It covered it, it didn't get rid of it. Shirley, you look like you had a thought you wanted to... Well, I was going to say, and it had no power to put sin to death. Ah, it had no power, no power to put to sin death. to death. And it had no power to enable us to live free from that sin. Because it was external. The law was external, and it ever remains external. It doesn't, there's nothing, it doesn't put anything in you. Okay, it gives you knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of what sin is. <laughs> knowledge of what you should do, not what you shouldn't do. But there's no power to put the sin nature to death and no power to equip you to live contrary to sin. Okay? It, it does not give us any ability. To, it was incapable of of providing our fallen nature, our flesh, with the ability to live lives that are pleasing to God. Okay? So, the law was weak through the flesh. Does that mean the law was weak? Was the law weak? No. Huh? No, the law was powerful. But it was, it was weak through the flesh in that our flesh, and, and the limitation there was our flesh, not the law. Does that make sense? Okay. Grubbing a good word on Fridays, by the way. That's what the reminder was for the two other guys that are in the room. So, okay. 
We understand that Jesus is God's Son who was sent. But how are we to understand the description that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh? Is it because he was a hundred percent man? Okay. And when man was born or shaped, he was shaped in sin. He came with a sinful nature. So when God sent him to the earth, he came as a hundred percent man. He was God, but Okay. Now, when you said when 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 man came forth, he was sinful. It, I, as, you're talking about after the fall, those yeah, who were born. When those we were born. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, we were sinful. I kind of knew what you. Yeah. And when Christ came, he came as a human. So as a human, he had came in <clears throat> sinful flesh. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. It's really. It's a this is a declaration of Christ's humanity, which is exactly what you're saying. He was a hundred percent man. He was subject to the same temptations and struggles we are. And sometimes it, that's, I think that's a difficult thing for people to reconcile. Sometimes, it is. you know. Well, but he was Jesus, yeah. But he was still a hundred percent man. He was subject to the same temptations and struggles that we are. If he was not, then he did not qualify as the Savior. Because if he was not subject to the same things, then, you know, that would be like me trying to walk in to a hospital room and pretend to be a nurse. I'm not a nurse. I have no training as a nurse. How can you, you, you know, I that, that nurse stuck me with that needle today. I didn't even hardly feel it. She pulled two vials of blood out of me like nobody's business. She says, oh, that's going to leave a bruise. I pulled the Band-Aid off later, clean as a whistle. You know, if I did that, it looks like I beat you with a sledgehammer. Would you say, Elaine? I wouldn't want to be around. Yeah. I wouldn't either. Yeah. No, yeah, Jesus, this is a declaration of his humanity. He was subject to the same things that we, that we are. The difference was, and yeah. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He set aside those divine prerogatives, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, he emptied himself. Take. Oh, that verse is repeated twice. Yeah. Well, that's a mistake. That's a that's a typographical error that we we'll have to correct. But at any rate, um, yeah. I mean, he emptied himself, set his, set aside those divine prerogatives, and came as a hundred percent man. Hebrews chapter two, verses fifteen and seventeen says, "We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize." with our weaknesses. Those double negatives are difficult there. We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Does that make it a little clearer? One who has been tempted in all things as we are, therefore we had to be, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people because he's been there. He was qualified to do that. And that's what Paul's talking about here when he speaks of him coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. Was he sinful? No. But he was just like us and had the same experience that we did in this earth with one exception. He was not tainted by sin, and he did not, did not participate in sin. So it's actually two exceptions, but it's the same thing. The end of verse 15, in Hebrews 4 above, that I left out, as we are yet without sin. And so that's the declaration of who he was, and that's the distinction. Um, 
So he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet he successfully lived this life without sin, and that as an example for us. So does that mean we can live sinlessly? Huh? Ourselves? We don't have to sin. Hmm? We don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. But does it mean we will live, will we live sinlessly? No. no. Yeah, no. No, not in this life. Because we will evermore be tainted by sin. The sin nature is always there. Oh, can we be less sinful today than we were yesterday? Yes. Ah, uh, uh, that that comes back to the word Jamie used: growth, maturity. You know, I've been walking with the Lord for four years, and I don't do some of the stupid stuff I did when I first got saved. But trust me, stupid still follows me all day long. <laughs> And stupid shows up more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> Even if it doesn't come out of my mouth, it shows up in my attitude. Ask her, she'll tell you. Yeah, I mean she you know, she won't she won't rat me out, but she takes the if, if anybody takes the brunt of my stupid, it's probably my wife more than anybody. No. <laughs> hey, you know, but that's the reality of humanity, you know. And that's why when it, when I've stood in the pulpit, and I, I know I'll do it again, I say this is a terrible neighborhood. This is a bad neighborhood. Why? Because even if it doesn't come out of here, even if you don't see it, even if you don't perceive it, who was it was ta we were talking to the other day? They said that their face betrays them. Was it Jamie? Yeah. I'm guilty. I, there are times where I know I, 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 I'm doing, by God's grace, I'm doing everything I can to restrain myself. But my face is telling the story. And if anybody has the, 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 the decoder ring, they can understand exactly what I'm saying. You know, Be, Why? Because we're human. We're human. We'll never be sinless in this life. Can we be less sinful than we were? Absolutely. Everybody in this room is. Everybody in this room is. Because there's nobody here that is living the way that you were living before you came to Christ. Nobody. 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 I don't care if you got saved yesterday or 20 years ago. 10 minutes ago. That, that initial impact of the holiness and the righteousness of God on your life. We are positionally the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And as we're going to talk more about, as we go through the book of uh, chapter 8 of the book of Romans, we're going to talk about that we're walking this thing out. Now it's a matter of walking it out and living it out. In our own strength, no. No, not at all. Not at all. What is Paul referring to when he speaks of Jesus being an offering for sin in verse 3. Norman. I, I put down his, his death on the cross. His death on the cross. Jamie? I put down that um, he was the lamb. He was pure of sin, unblemished, and he was given up to pay for our debts, the debts that we couldn't pay. The only thing that would do it was him. Yeah, that's exactly right. You, you, it was his death on the cross. And as we're told in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. In the Old Testament, Kathy mentioned this a minute ago, animals were offered as sacrifice for sin, and those animals had to be without blemish. But even then, the, the blood of lambs and goats had to be offered constantly because it just covered it. It didn't cleanse it away. It didn't wash it away. It didn't eliminate it. It just covered it. Because Jesus was sinless, he offered himself without blemish to God, according to Hebrews 9.14, as the fulfillment of the imagery provided by the Passover lamb when, uh, when Israel exited Egypt. He is the Passover lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, that the, the, the blood might be put 
over the doorpost, on the doorposts, and over the lentil of our lives, the lentil of our lives, that we might be free um, from that sin. In doing so, he became the offering for sin for all of those who accept him as having done so. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but those of the whole world. Propitiation is a, is a big theological word that means full payment completely for everything past, present, and future. That's what Jesus did. He paid for your sin that you committed in your past. He paid for the sin you committed right now. And he's already paid for the sin you will commit in the future. Well, let's all go sin then. No. That's contrary to what Paul is teaching, contrary to everything that he has said up to this point in time. And it says there, all, but also for the whole world. So does that mean that nobody needs to do everything? Jesus has already paid for it? Then you shook your head no. Died on the cross, of course, then we still have to be active and keep growing, moving forward. It's not a one time thing. Yeah. Right. And the first thing we have to do is accept Christ as our Savior. Yeah. Until we do that, yeah. there is no gain, you know, to yeah. play. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it's John 1 12 that says, To as many as received him, to them, he gave the right. I don't. I, I think that reference is wrong, but it's in John. <laughs> For as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons. We got to receive him first. We've got to accept his right. payment. We've got to acknowledge that we needed a savior. That's the starting point. And then acknowledging we needed a savior, we've got to recognize that he's the one that paid the price, and then we've got to accept that payment. Is it available to the whole world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody's excluded from that. And we've covered this ground too. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer. He was right there. Huh? It's, uh, it's, John 1 12? Mm -hmm. Well, how about that? Like garlic and prego, it is in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, nobody is exempt from that. Anybody can come to Christ. Romans uh, also says, uh, whoever will may come. Okay. What is God's goal in releasing us from the law of sin and death? Um, somebody read Romans 8, 4, and then somebody else read. Shirley, you're up for reading, and Elaine. Elaine, you read 8, 4, and Shirley, would you read 7, 4, please? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Therefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who has raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So what is God's goal in releasing us from the law of sin and death? That it might be fulfilled in you through us. And what might be fulfilled? The law. Okay. That we're led by the court of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> no. That we live by the Holy Spirit. That we would live by the Holy Spirit. And that as we live by the Holy Spirit, we would bear this fruit. <clears throat> that we would bear fruit is what he says there. What fruit's he talking about? Galatians 5 22. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Galatians 5, 22. Nine. That we might bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in our loves, in our lives, in our loves, in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, as well as leading others to faith in him, that he might be glorified in and through us. That's the fruit that God wants us to bear. But again, it's by His Spirit working in us and through us, not by us sucking it up, cupcake, and walking this thing out. 
It's not by our own effort. When I first got saved, um, I've told you about my friend Kevin and how he and I, we went where no man had gone before. You know, we, we were, we were called ourselves walking with Jesus, but we had nobody teaching us. And, um, we had some really oddball ideas and, uh, you know, Kevin was teaching me, but I think Kevin didn't know any more than I did. But, you know, he, he talked about the fruit of the Spirit as if it's something that we needed to do. we got to do this. We've, you've got to love. You've got to have joy. You've got to show peace. Wait, wait, I'm incapable of this stuff. I'm in turmoil here. It's the fruit of the Spirit. As we walk in the Spirit or led by the Spirit, He will do that work in and through us. And that we will produce that fruit of Him being in control of our lives and of course the last one there that that one makes everybody skittish that self-control thing you know, self-control bah who wants self-control well that's that's part of the fruit of the spirit and if we're walking with him and being led by him we will manifest these fruit so okay we're going to stop there tonight let me see if i can't print some more notes for you guys